Uh, now, if I continue, it's going to take me about three more minutes. Uh, do you want me to do that or not? Okay, okay. Well, um, the, I want to say a word or two that has to do with belief in God specifically. Uh, this section is called the object of worship or reverence. Uh, in this area, consider the following as a starting point for reflection. Among the traditions that involve an object of worship, the most worthwhile are those that direct that worship in the most appropriate direction, namely a being that's worthy of worship. To worship is to hurl yourself with passionate intensity into love of and adoration towards the being who is the object of your worship. That's, I'm just saying that's the definition of what worship is. Uh, it's nicely stated in John Wesley's unforgettable phrase, to be lost in wonder, love, and awe. Now, being worthy of worship by any beings, including humans, would involve many elements. If I'm just saying this is a sort of not this is not this is not a statement of any particular religious commitment. This is an analysis of what it would be for something to be worthy of worship. Um, a being would be worthy of worship only if it encapsulated perfection, or something close to perfection, uh, along a number of dimensions, including wisdom and knowledge. A worship-worthy being would, in fact, be goodness deified. Right, it would be goodness on a on a uh, an extraordinary scale. Uh, theism, belief in God, therefore involves the highest and most worthy and most praiseworthy things we can think of being understood to be encapsulated in a reality that's taken to be independent of us that we can encounter and that we can grasp to some extent. However, the goodness that is partly definitive of such a being can be conceived of in various ways, and we have no option but to understand it in terms of our currently fullest grasp of what it consists in. Uh, so a worship-worthy being, from our point of view, therefore of necessity, has to be one that encapsulates our conception of goodness, which will in turn reflect our ethical judgments, for example. Including in our, in our conception of God, our current recognition of what it would be to be a morally admirable being, thereby giving a particular content to our idea of a worship-worthy being, is not a matter of fabricating our conception of God as we go along. Actually, for believers in God, there's no avoiding a sort of reflection that may result in supplementing or modifying your conception of God, and that this... Uh, and, and there's no avoiding this being thought of by those who engage in it as a matter of providing a deeper understanding of God. Uh, we might refer to it as constructive theology. Indeed, this sort of approach is already standard practice in the theistic traditions, as exemplified in, say, occasions on which prophetic voices have declared that God has a particular concern with the welfare of the worst off, in contexts in which this dimension had previously been ignored. It's only common sense for theists to think that if we make moral progress in some areas, some area, perhaps realizing that a central, a certain concern is one that we should have had all along, and that our failure to have it was a, certain, a serious deficiency on our part, what we have come across is in effect a discovery concerning the object of worship. In general, there's no avoiding thinking of God as encapsulating what we currently recognize as profoundly morally significant. Uh, consequently, uh, to bring this to a close, if we really have the obligations that I outlined at the start of this talk, uh, an obligation to pursue success as a global citizen, uh, to combat the wiping out of forms of life that's occurring on a global scale and more besides, then what all believers in God, in my view, are committed to is the idea that there's an external reality that's deeply supportive of, congruent with, conducive to, in line with, and so on, the fulfillment of those obligations, and that seems to me to be no trivial matter. Thanks.